not to lose it. Um, it's also really comfortable. You, you generally, when you, when you use this, you use it, it it's a more uh, even kind of heat. People find that it's a more comfortable kind of heat. It's also good with humidity control. Now this looks like, like a typical residential site energy use, and about 60% of it is, is heating and air conditioning. And with geothermal, you can supply the heat, you can supply the air conditioning, you can supply a lot of the hot water as well. So after, um, after setting up a geothermal system, you're using about half of the energy that you used to be using. Total, so the total site energy consumption is reduced by a factor of two. The total, the, the total energy consumption is You're using about half. You're using about half of what you used to use in terms of total energy. Right. That's one thing. Okay, so you know people are skeptical. There's a really good example that if from uh, Oklahoma, there are two kind of side-by-side -side buildings that have the same kind of construction. Um, I can refer you to this report if, you, if you're interested. But the uh, energy cost, you know, is, is 96 cents in the geo building and it's two thousand two two dollars and twelve cents a square foot in the non-geo building. Here, here you kind of see the demand reduction, the green is the geothermal building, the red is the non-geothermal building. And here's the energy savings. The, the goal, I think, is the... How does, how does this work? Um, I'm sorry, I, lo I did not bring my glasses today, so I'm not... The, the, on the left it says... DAV system, and on the right it says geothermal. Right, I'm, I'm oh. over, over on the right there. I can't see that either, okay. even though I have glasses. Okay, so the gold is the total total energy used, and the red is the electricity used, and the green is gas used. So you see you're using even less electricity, um, and that's largely because the air conditioning is much more efficient with geothermal than it is with a, a, a regular air conditioning system. So I'm wondering, um, what's the cost of the Woodbridge house in the sawing the system? We didn't do that system, and, and I'm not quite sure. I, I, I didn't get that. Um, it, is, it is a large expense up front, and, and Cost. Yeah, and a lot of that, you know, has to do with what we're doing at this point in terms of how we subsidize things and, you know, what costs we leave out of things. We're, we're moving ahead on natural gas drilling. We don't really have our stuff together in terms of, um, you know, having any funds there for environmental disasters, for people's water supplies and so on and so forth. Um, and we're not putting enough incentives into the reuse. Uh, there's also been Habitat for Humanity houses that were done using GEO. Um, once again, on the far left, I, I think is the, is the total, and this kind of breaks down the different aspects of, of the house and the degree to which um, the geothermal helps reduce. The, the, oh, the tan is a standard home. The yellow is a standard home with, with geothermal. Um, and then the, the other colors are low energy homes with geothermal, and then finally geothermal with PV, which is what Susan has on, on the bridge. Okay, so here's a typical installation. This is the guy on the left, is, uh, uh, his name is Todd Schmiegel. He's from Schmiegel Plumbing and Heating. He is someone who, um, the two kind of principals in the company are Jens Panikow, who is someone who is a doctor from Germany, who came over after putting himself through med school by doing geothermal there, doing hundreds of installations, and then Todd, who is kind of a local Buffalo plumber guy, and they kind of put together this, this company to do this. And here is Todd and William when they finish the job, and when they take you through the job. So it starts, this is, this is Jens in the middle. Uh, he's kind of a little Dutch boy, you know, kind of walking around, looking at your property, and he's kind of walking things off to see where uh, a loop would go. He checks out your uh, electrical system. You know, we generally look for like a 200 amp electrical system with some excess capacity because we're going to have to be putting in this, you know, this new electrical um, 
piece. We look at your, your old system. This is a house that had radiant flooring. We look at the condition of that. We look at the insulation in the house. We look at you know what your comfort situation is in the house. What 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 temperature do you keep the house at? Are there other alternative sources like like a a wood stove or whatever? And then we do some calculations of what the heat loss is in your house. Then we give um, a, an estimate of what it's going to cost, and we break it down, you know, pretty finely between. The, the heat loop and the heat pump and, and the different labor factors, so on and so forth. Then we get started. This is a, a job that was done up, up north of Buffalo. Put up a sign. The first thing that's usually done is, is a, and this is for a, a horizontal loop. We'll talk about the different kinds of loops. But this is essentially, a, it's not a well, it's, it's a loop. So we start by digging out near the house where the, the pipes are going to come in. And this kind of shows it when that part's done. Uh, this is William kind of setting up the, the pipes and sealing them uh, after he has drilled a hole in the basement wall. This is the excavator digging away from the side of the house. And then a, a long trench. It's about eight feet deep. And uh, the, the way we look at this is, is um, the heat pumps come by the ton which is essentially the equivalent of 12,000 BTUs of energy that's kind of going to be your maximum of what you're going to need at the peak of winter. Most houses around here are in the three or four ton neighborhood. And when we do the um, uh, trench, it's, it's essentially about 100 feet per ton that we need. If there's not enough room on our property, we will go to, to digging wells. So this is what it looks like after the slinky loop um, of the pipes goes into the trench. Don't do this at home. <laughs> um, this is, you know, a couple different trenches. And they, they come and this is, it's, it's, it's been filled in behind of that one, the, the row on the left. This is uh, a bunch of the pipes coming together before heading in, into a manifold, before heading into the house. And once everything is set within the trenches, we uh, fill it and pressurize it and make sure that, that there's no leaks. Adam, um, uh, use cast steel for the outside? Steel? Yeah. No, it's, this is all plastic. Plastic? Yeah. 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 There's been some, some pretty significant advances in geothermal in the last several years. And some of it is the, the, the kind of piping you can do the slinkies with, and some of it is the efficiency of the um, this is kind of the filling up the, the, uh, with the liquid that's going to go through the pipes. And here um, we're, we're painting this, this uh, material on the outside of the pipes to make sure there's no leaks. If there was leaks, that would bubble up. And then it's all filled over. And what happens, the pipes come in, the white thing at the bottom is called a flow control. It, it controls the flow of going through the one loop, the ground loop, and then bringing it in through the house. The pipes are insulated in the house. They'll usually run along the ceiling. And this is, essentially, we have taken out the old furnace. We've used the, um, the, the vents and, and the, you know, the, the steel. Um, Air, air vents and we just connect it up with them. You can see in the top there's kind of a, a rubber, a black rubber piece and that's to uh, dull the noise. And you can also see some, some tape um, to, to avoid leaks where, where the connections are with the old uh, vent pipes. This is the inside of, of what a heat pump looks like. Uh, you can't really see those coils that I was talking about in this slide, but they're in there. And here's the taping job that we do to make sure there's no leaks. And he's kind of putting finish, finishing touches there. This is Todd connecting up to the hot water heater. And essentially, in a lot of cases, um, we set up an auxiliary hot water tank that will we'll take some of the heat off the geothermal system and you know set up a buffer tank. And when you need um, heat hot water, it'll draw it out of the buffer tank 
and either a gas or electric furnace will kind of peak it up, you know, so, you, so that you can use it in the house. That's usually the most efficient and, and cost effective way to do it. You could completely supply the hot water but And here we're testing for pressure and, and uh, so forth in the system. And this is Todd and William and then uh, This concerns uh, the previous thing about the coil being laid in the trench. Yes. Um, can the coils be placed under concrete? Yes. So uh, it's really just um, a matter of uh, how problematic you want to you know, get when, into. When you're saying under concrete, you're, you're yes. talking about like a sidewalk or something? Sure. Like yeah. if you're in a more urban area. Oh, yeah. Like say you're you know, planting a neighborhood. Yep. You could you can uh, plant trees over them. Yeah. That's, that's okay. But could they even be you know, part of under the street? It could be. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter as long as um, it's at a certain depth yeah. and it will still absorb yeah. the heat. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, there's a whole science to, to different soil types and so on and so forth and how that deals with the, the heat transfer and so forth. We've got really good soil here in western New York. This is kind of an ideal climate. At what point into the trees, I understand initially um, the trees wouldn't be there, but at what point would the roots be a problem going down here? It's eight feet down. Um, it's usually not, you know, there hasn't there hasn't been problems. Yeah. So there's different types of loops. There's an open system. What we just saw is a, is a closed system because the, the liquid all stays in the pipes. Okay. You I'm can sorry, also another quick question about yeah. the liquids. Yeah. Um, how available are the is the substances that make up the liquids? Again, thinking about economies of scale. I mean, if we really went big with this. Like I know we have trouble with rock, with the, the, the raw earth, um, the rare earth, metal. rare earth metals yeah. that go into these sorts of things. Yeah. How abundant are they? They're abundant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it's, it's mainly water. It's water with some, some antifreeze that's in okay. the air. And then the refrigerant, you know, is another thing. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's particularly rare. I mean, you have to design it so it's not going to impact the ozone layer the way refrigerants are designed. Do you, know, do you know what the chemical is that's used as a refrigerant now? I don't. I, don't. I, can, I can get it to you if it's important to you. I can look it up. So in an open system, and, I, and the pond kind of makes this screwy, but essentially it happens when you, when you, have, when you run into an aquifer. And you can just kind of run water, you, you pull water out of the aquifer, and you don't need antifreeze because you're dealing with you know, an aquifer that's, that's um, at, a, at a pretty constant constant temperature, but you pull it from the aquifer and then put it back to the aquifer. And there is a house that we did on Lincoln Parkway that's done that way. And this, this shows the drilling um, when that was done, and this is what's left. You can barely tell that there was anything done there. Um, if you look real close, you can see this little cap. The drilling. Horizontal loop is the most common and the least expensive, and it's done the, the way I just showed you. You do a trench, you run pipes through the trench. There's a lot of different ways to configure the pipes. We found the slinking loop to be the best way to go. Um, Jens at his own house has uh, geothermal, and he's tried it with different types of slinkies, different formations of the slinkies. He's got one where he's got a slinky going up on one side and on the other side. And he's also, he's got that uh, computer modeling thing happening, so he's looking at them all the time to see what kind of results he's getting. Um, so yeah, it's high density polyethylene, it's guaranteed for 50 years. Um, it's, the heat fusion process is kind of the most important thing in terms of not getting leaks, uh, and you, you do need some, some training to do that. And then there's vertical loops. Um, we're doing a house on Grant Street right now at 197 Grant across from Sweetness 7. Um, and, and that's essentially you're doing a well. And what you're doing is you're digging down deep into the earth and then you're putting the pipes down in that hole and then you know compacting around the pipes. So it's still a closed system. Uh, and that's because there's not enough room to dig trenches at that property on Grant Street. And this is a picture of, of the property on Grant. That there, they, they've dug the holes. The uh, what looks like cement all over the place is actually the um, the rock. It, you know, it pulverizes the rock essentially when you're when you're digging it. But you can see it's you know very little um, ultimate impact 
it's, it's a really pretty small hole at the beginning. And then there's a pond loop. Pond loops are fun. If you have a pond that's you know nine feet or deeper, the water is pretty constant temperature at the bottom, and, and it really works well. Um, this we're setting up the loops. You, you, you essentially have a bunch of slinkies. You're connecting them with with pipe. You put those all together. You put some weights um, on the pipe, and you kind of we, we tie uh, the ends of this and. and bring the rope across the other end of the pond and two of us are pulling this into the water. And it, it goes out into the middle and it doesn't sink until you fill the, uh, the pipes. And at that point it sinks. And I got to swim out into the pond and cut the ropes for this. All right, so the cost. Um, okay, the Air Force Institute of Technology looked at it and said, essentially seven to eight years to recoup the costs. And it depends on a lot of different things. It depends on what you're using now. It depends on whether you're drilling or doing trenches. It depends on how well your house is insulated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also good because you know, it redu reduces peak demand for utility companies. So it's kind of good for everybody when you, when you do this. Um, so here's the cost to deliver uh, a million BTUs. And the ground source heat, heat pump is over on the, the far right, and this is kind of the relative cost. So fuel oil is very expensive. We have a lot of fuel oil in this area, largely north and south of the city. And that's where Buffalo Geothermal is able to do a lot of work and really make a lot of difference for people at this point, given the natural gas prices. You can see natural gas is, is the next cheapest to ground source heat pumps. Air source heat heat pumps. This is something where you don't use the heat of the earth. You just set up a heat pump outside of your house. You pull the air through it. You do the refrigeration cycle, and you've got warmer air coming in. The problem with air source heat pumps is because is when it gets really cold, it can't do the lift necessarily necessary to get the cold air, you know, gen and generate enough heat to get warm air going inside. And then electric resistance heating is, is the most expensive. Thing. And they also did, uh, you know, looking at what happens if there's a 25% increase, you know, in, in um, energy rates. And, you know, the advantage increases with geothermal relative to the others. So, let's take a typical example. We have a, a new house. It's about 2,600 square feet. We figure that would be about a four-ton system. If it's forced air, um, you would use domestic hot water as well. Um, in a regular house, it would be about $2,600 to heat air conditioning and use domestic hot water in that, and there's access to cheap natural gas. Um, so, so for a typical install of that size, it would be about $25,000. Um, at this point, there's a 30% federal tax break, a, a federal tax credit, which you can take over several years. So that knocks $7,200 off right there. So it's $16,000 $16, that you're looking at if this was a new build, you would need to spend, and I think 10000 is probably a big, a, a high estimate, but you'd need to spend a lot of money to set up the furnace in, in the new house. And if that was $10,000, you'd have $6,800 in upfront costs. Like I said, it qualifies for the federal tax credit. This is a, a site called the Desire Site. Uh, it's a database of um, renewable energy incentives that's pretty readily available. You can see there's a 30% tax credit, um, and it, for anything that's placed in service after 2008, there's no maximum on it, and the tax credit uh, expires in 2016. So if, if you had natural gas, you'd have an, an, an annual savings of about $1,300, and if, you, if it was costing you $6,800 more, we're figuring that's a five-year payback time. If it's something like propane, you know, where you're paying a lot more every year for your heat, it would be like $2,900 every year, and then you can pay it back, you know, in, in two or three years. You know, if you put that into, in terms of a mortgage, if you, if you essentially borrowed money to do this, um, it would be a $400 annual mortgage cost. 
and you, you have $1,500 in energy savings over here. Uh, but one, one of the things that you have to look at at this point is, is predicting the future in terms of where natural gas prices are going. And yes, if they keep being able to, to, to frack us, um, they might stay low for a little while, but that's not going to last indefinitely. And uh, it's, it's going to go up because you're using a lot more. If you have a natural gas system, it's going to go up quite a bit more over the years than the geothermal. Propane, you know, using, if you look at it over a long period of time, you're really saving a lot of money. Um, okay, so as I mentioned before, West New York is one of the best places in the world for this. Our, our soil is generally pretty dense clay. There's usually a high amount of moisture in the, in the soil. And it's really useful because there's pretty high fluctuations. You know, the winter it gets really cold and in the summer it gets really hot. So we're using this stuff. Um, Pretty, pretty extensively. If you've got a, system, a, a situation like that in Florida or something where you don't have the, the cold winters to deal with, it, it pays off a, a lot less, even though you still get to use a bunch of it for air conditioning. So in terms of what are favorable site characteristics, as I mentioned, in Western New York, with natural gas at the prices they're at right now. Okay, okay, I, I would be very quick. Um, you know, at this point, if you don't need to replace your furnace and you've got natural gas and you're not a really, really committed environmentalist that you're looking to go net zero, it's not going to make economic sense at this point. When gas prices go up, it probably will. For new builds, it makes a lot of sense. We are working with Natali builders on a whole development at this point where geothermal is the basic and you can opt out of it if you want, but otherwise you're not going to have it. If you need to replace a furnace, that's a good time to do it. If you do have a pond, that's, that's very helpful. Um, those kind of circumstances are really favorable for doing it. Uh, this is a, the website, Buffalo Geothermal website. You can go on that website and you can see what's happening in, in a bunch of people's houses in Western New York at this point. This is some of the kind of things that we diagram for people. What's the actual address of uh, the website? Is it? If, you know, if you Google Buffalo Geothermal, I, I'm not sure what the URL is. Okay. And the, the rest of this is essentially talking about what's happening worldwide. It is increasing quite a bit. It's being used a lot in Europe. At this point in Sweden for new builds, it's about 95% of the new builds are going with geothermal. Uh, here are the countries that are using it worldwide. Here's where the, the heat pumps are being shipped in the United States. So there's, there's a good amount of activity in New York that they're bringing this more. Um, so essentially, it's the most efficient, there's no emissions, it's a long life expectancy, it does add value to your home, um, you get independence from fossil fuels. Uh, the EPA rates it as the most energy efficient and environmentally clean way of doing space conditioning. This is a survey that was done by the Rural Electric Cooperatives, 97% of owners would purchase one again, 99% would recommend one to a friend, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, so, so my, my question would be is that it's, uh, it's an expensive system. And right now it's heavily dependent on government subsidies in terms of tax rebates and stuff to make it let, let me close say something to about, about, more about that if I can. And, and you, you're, you're right, we can get into that. But we talked about the 30%. The other piece is we are telling people New York State has a solar tax credit of 25% um, up to $5,000, 25% of the cost of the system, we're telling people to look at taking that. And most, most of the customers have taken it because- Yeah, well, that's my point. It's, it's heavily dependent on government subsidies it's, it, to, to, for it to be close to being economically viable. Um, it, that makes it vulnerable. Well, if you look at the cost over time, however, it's a good investment, so. Even, even without the, the investment from the government, it's still you recoup your money over time. Yeah, and it's, it, what uh, Bill was talking about was a 30%, as I recall, reduction due to the federal tax credit. So, yes, well, it would be 30% more expensive without that tax credit, but that would just mean that it would take 30% longer to, to get a payback. The, the other aspect is that it, it basically increases electric demand because you're taking 
uh, from the, the gas company or whatever, and you're running a compressor for a longer period of time. So you're dependent on the electric electric grid, you know, which unfortunately is a lot of a lot of that is coal. So this is another thing to, to think about, and I'd, I'd like to see the you know the long term projections. Okay, so so gas prices rise. Well, you know, electric prices rise too. So these are considerations that need to be factored in. You're you're right, Art, and you know we do need. I mean, we need to make decisions about what kind of energy system we're going to have, and we need to incentivize the stuff that's good, and, and there's no political guarantee that that's going to happen. Um, you know, if, if, if oil and gas were not subsidized and geothermal was not subsidized, you know, that's a world I would probably let, rather live in than the one we live in right now. But ideally, we should not be subsidizing mature technologies and particularly polluting technologies like oil and gas. And we should be used pushing all the subsidy towards renewables. Mm -hmm. I was going to comment that the federal government is subsidizing this moment. It's an immature industry. It's an immature industry. It's just getting started. They don't have economies to scale. And if, and over time, more people use this, the industry will develop Thanks, everybody. You, you Thank need you. to get going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> George, what were you going to say? Oh, I haven't heard of what's here, right? Close the heights.